Did you know that today, April 17th, is one of my favorite days in all of gay history? And no, it's not because tomorrow's my birthday. On April 15th, 1965, Cuba's state-run newspaper, El Mundo, announced that Fidel Castro's communist government intended to impose revolutionary social hygiene to address the rampant and abominable vice of homosexuality. And the next day, on April 16th, the New York Times carried the news. This was understood, it concluded, as a warning that homosexuals would be rounded up and sent to labor camps. For months, early gay activists in Washington had been inching, slowly but surely, towards publicly demonstrating against the federal government's gay purges. Until then, there had only been a single tiny picket in New York a few months earlier, organized by activist Randy Wicker. Why weren't homosexuals marching? Well, keep in mind, if you showed your face at a demonstration, carrying a sign for gay rights in the nation's capital, there was a very good possibility that the FBI or the police department's morals division would take your photograph. They would look for your license plate number. They would identify you, and then they would make sure that you were fired from your federal job. And often, that information traveled with you to your future private employers, essentially marking you for the rest of your life as a sexual deviant. Frank Kameny, the founder of the Madison Society of Washington, had been urging caution about picketing. It was a good idea in theory, he believed, but he argued that you needed a reason to be demonstrating. Just like in 1955, Rosa Parks had sparked the Montgomery bus boycott, homosexuals needed some sort of catalyst to justify a pivot to direct action, especially one that was so risky. So with the homosexual labor camp story in the New York Times, Frank Kameny at last was convinced to organize the world's first picket in front of the White House against gay discrimination. And on April 17th, 1965, exactly 55 years ago, seven men and three women silently marched in a circle. The men wore suits and the women wore dresses. Their signs said, 15 million US homosexuals protest federal treatment and Cuba's government persecutes homosexuals, but the US government beat them to it, among others. Marchers like Lily Vincennes, the first lesbian member of the Mattachine Society of Washington, were terrified that they would be attacked by spectators or harassed by the police. But to everyone's surprise, nothing happened at all. Only a very few hostile remarks were passed by the throngs of tourists flocking and driving by, wrote Kameny in a press release. And although there was barely any press coverage at all, only a single African-American paper covered the protest, the demonstrators pledged to pick it again with more notice. And the next time, the marchers would also be immunized against fear, as Jack Nichols, another MSW member, later put it. So over four full years before Stonewall, homosexuals were marching en masse against the government's systematic persecution of sexual deviants. And they would continue marching at the White House, the State Department, the Civil Service Commission, at the Pentagon, and also annually at the Independence Hall in Philadelphia, all the way up until Stonewall. And even after the riots, the homophile organizations voted to transform these very significant pickets into a newer demonstration, an annual one that commemorated the riots. And that's why each June we celebrate Pride. So tonight, raise a glass to my personal hero and the subject of my upcoming book, Dr. Frank Kameny. We have pride, we have our rights, and the fight continues because of him. I'm Dr. Eric Cervini, and that was The Sip of History. I'll see you next time on Quarantini.